It's a great honor for me uh, to speak uh, to you in the framework of this uh, seminar. And I must, uh, looking at the audience, I must say that it is for me even a bigger challenge than I had thought before. Because uh, first you invited to these seminars eminent specialists, I would say worldwide known specialists. And uh, I cannot, absolutely cannot compare to them. And second, uh, looking at the audience, uh, I noticed that uh, uh, in the audience there are great experts, great specialists, much with much higher knowledge than myself, so uh, in, in this particular field. But uh, I have accepted this challenge, uh, and I really want to thank, in partic particular, Professor D'Ambrosio for uh, offering me this uh, unique opportunity to present you a few ideas on the topic of uh, inequality, especially also in the Luxembourgish context. And um, I also want to thank you, uh, Mr. Paolo Curlo, uh, for the invitation at the IEB and the flexibility, because I heard that you had to switch uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the rooms. Uh, and uh, so I thank you very much for receiving me and especially also receiving uh, the seminar. Well, um, I also hope that we, after my presentation, we can have a, a short uh, exchange and uh, a good uh, and stimulating uh, discussion. As you know, I'm not a scholar, but I have been involved in politics. Both are not very easy to, uh, to be compatible, to be a scholar and to be so long in politics as I have been. So, as you mentioned, I've been a Minister for Labour now for 13 years. But as a Minister of Labour, I have been close to social developments in Luxembourg and especially also at the European level. And I became a Minister of Labour when the financial and economic crisis had also reached Luxembourg. But even much more, some countries in Europe, and you know, Portugal, Greece, especially the southern member states in the European Union. Unemployment was surging, especially youth unemployment. The euro crisis was looming, banks were destabilized, Europe had to face a double dip recession, partly because austerity policies were launched too early and too massively. In many European countries, the social fabric was hit and the financial crisis followed by a debt crisis became an economic and above all, a social crisis. Although the European econ economy is back now on a growth path and the recovery has become more robust, this does not mean that all the scars of the previous major shocks have definitely vanished. Investment after a strong decline has not reached pre-crisis levels, which may explain part of the slow productivity gains. This is also the case for social investments that have been reduced in many countries in an, uh, for budgetary reasons. Unemployment has declined now, but in, in, in most of our member states, but it still remains high in comparison to pre-crisis levels. And especially the number of long-term unemployed has not decreased substantially. Precariousness is affecting certain groups on the labor market and notably the young. Questions have been raised about developed economies' growth potential. And prominent economists like Larry Summers, Harvard professor and former US Treasury Secretary, <laughs> considers that we have entered in a lengthy process of slower growth due to the excessive indebtedness and the difficult reduction of swelling liabilities. He has also added rising inequalities to the causes of this slow growth and he, he qualifies as a secular stagnation, which is not a new idea, which is not a new concept because this concept was put forth 
by Alvin Hansen in 1938 to describe the evolution of the American economy following the Great Depression. The war then changed this bleak economic perspective. Basically, the economic prospects today, as I see them, do not absolutely confirm that there is a too high risk of a decline in long-term growth, though there are major uncertainties like protectionism, financial instability, and indeed rising inequalities between countries and more particularly inside countries. <laughs> the improvements I just mentioned, and particularly the overall employment numbers, have not generally been followed by job quality, a higher income equality, and poverty reduction. Overall, inequalities along a number of different dimensions have increased during the crisis. But the increase in inequality, in inequality has not started with the crisis. It certainly has been amplified by the crisis and the austerity policies. In fact, the increase started well before, sometime in the late 70s, perhaps linked also to the to the 73-74 oil shock and the following economic downturn, but certainly uh, at the beginning of the 80s. And the causes are multiple. Globalization is always mentioned and certainly is also part of the, of the issue. Technological progress, transformation of many enterprises, uh, we remember the idea of these lean enterprises and the restructuring of enterprises coming uh, 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 at the beginning of the 80s. Weakening of the bargaining power of employees through trade unions who lost a big part of their membership in many countries, including in those where the membership was high. And I think this is also a very important element the neoliberal policies that have been implemented globally on the basis of the Washington consensus have certainly contributed through deregulation, financialization, tax cuts, tax cuts for the wealthiest to this uh, uh, increase of inequality. And we have seen that there has been a continuous concentration of wealth around what Stieglitz and some others call the famous 1% and a relative stagnation of wages. And reading uh, uh, Anthony Atkinson's book, Inequality, What Can Be Done, he also insists very much on this uh, concentration of wealth and especially also the stagnation of wages. I just want to... Uh, take the opportunity uh, to pay tribute uh, to Anthony Atkinson, uh, which, whom I had not the uh, opportunity to meet, though there was a meeting planned, because he was uh, not only an exceptional economist, he was also an exceptional humanist. And uh, so I think uh, this seminar uh, owns him a lot, and uh, so I think uh, it is... Uh, very important to, uh, uh, to uh, pay tribute to him. And I, I read one of the last books he was an editor of, and there was, uh, I think, one of the co-editor, Eric Marlier, wrote this very uh, important uh, phrase, Tony's demise represents an incalculable loss to all those who fight for social justice throughout the world. And I think he managed to be a very high-level analytical economist, and having this very strong commitment and engagement for a better world and for uh, more equality. So, when we look at, uh, at uh, wages, because that's an important element, and as I'm a, a labor minister, I, I'm always, I always start with wages, employment and wages. We see that there is quite early, not long time before the crisis, there is a gap between the evolution in productivity, these are the figures you see in OECD, and the hourly compensation, meaning the wages. So telling that 
the wages have always followed productivity is wrong. So there is this gap starting around the 80s, exactly. So this fits uh, uh, between productivity and uh, wages. So does it mean that growing inequality is just the result of normal economic development? It's reduction which took place after the big crisis and mainly the Second World War, the big crisis, I mean the 29 crisis, and mainly the Second World War being an exception because that was the period where inequality was reduced. Well, allow me to, to quote uh, Joseph Stiglitz in his book, The Great Divide. He writes, economic inequality is not just or even so much the result of inexorable laws of economics as it is of our polit policies and politics. It is, in this sense, a matter of choice, but here we have a vicious circle as economic inequality leads to and reinforces political inequality, which simply reinforces our economic inequality. So he refers more particularly to the US context where inequality and politics and financing politics is very much under in, uh, intertwined, but uh, it is something which applies also to other parts in the world. And we see that this political side of inequality uh, has produced also phenomena like uh, populism in the US with the election of Trump, Brexit uh, in the US, uh, in, the, in the UK, and uh, the uh, uh, surge of uh, populist parties in, uh, 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 in many European uh, uh, countries. There is none at least a change in the perception of inequality and its social and economic uh, consequences. And this is not only the case for many prominent economists like uh, Stieglitz, Atkinson or Piketty. Many now of economists are focusing on the issue, but, and I think this is also a, po a positive evolution, inequality has become a widely recognized political issue by the major international institutions like the IMF, OECD, but even in Davos, people talk about inequality and especially also uh, in the framework of uh, the European Union, I will come to it. The dominant neoclassical economic theory has a rather simple explanation for income distribution based on the supply and the demand of each factor of production interacting in factor markets to determine equilibrium, equilibrium output, income, and the income distribution. We know that the real world does not correspond to this model. And therefore, they, this is qualified by an author, which I recommend you, called David Orell, as an economyth, a myth. And in his book, 11 Ways Economics Gets It Wrong, he really shows how finally this neoclassical model is far from reality, but serves, serves the purpose of those, finally, who want some policies uh, uh, getting through. So this is uh, a critical analysis of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, neoclassical uh, economic thinking. But I also want to refer to an article uh, by another Nobel Prize winner, Angus Deaton, a recent article uh, with the title, Unfairness, Not Inequality is the Real Problem. And here, Angus Stratton writes that the fact that median real wages in the US have stagnated over the past 50 years should not be mainly attributed to globalization and technical, uh, technological innovation, even if those factors had some impact, but, and here it comes, to the capacity of the wealthy to capture the benefits of these changes, globalization and technical changes. So the benefits of these processes for themselves. And by doing so, the rich are getting richer at the expense of everyone else. And this shows that markets and neoclassical thinking is ba based on the well-functioning of markets. So, that markets do not function in relation to 
uh, good income distribution. And Deaton concludes that there is a need for right policies to put the power of competition back in the service of the middle and working classes. This also means that inequality reduction is not just a question of uh, uh, income redistribution, but of policies intervening at pre-distribution level. So the state has a double function, ex post and ex ante, but I will come back to that later. So it is also remarkable that IMF economists recognize that income inequalities has been rising so rapidly in the United States and around the world that it is threatening uh, economic growth and making economic growth less durable. So inequality has really become uh, an economic issue for the IMF, and I could go on also quoting OECD, and OECD has now during the last years invested a lot of research on the inequality issue, uh, and they had published uh, two or three years ago of, uh, a, a very interesting report uh, where they say that income inequality in OECD countries is at its highest level for the past half century, so we go back quite a long time, and the benefits of growth have not been evenly distributed, and high levels of income inequality have risen further, reaching, I quote, in 2014, the highest value on record since the mid-80s. In this report, uh, they make a very interesting relationship between inequality and investing in human capital potential. And I think this is a key issue, inequality and human capital, education, uh, especially in the view of uh, the changes in our economies uh, towards uh, uh, higher levels of uh, technological progress, digitalization, and so on. So to finish those more general remarks, I would like to have a brief look also at the European Union and the policies to reduce inequalities. The treaty limits EU competences in the social field, which remains fundamentally with national governments. But at the same time, the European integration project is according, and I quote Professor Vandenbroek, a convergence machine. And he writes in a recent book, its output legitimacy, the output legitimacy of the European Union, was based on the simultaneous pursuit of economic progress on the one hand and of social progress and cohesion on the other hand, both within countries through the gradual development of welfare states and between countries through upward convergence across the Union. And Van der Burg concludes, since 2000, 2008, we observe exactly the opposite, growing inequalities within a significant number of member states and divergence across the Eurozone. Europe is becoming more unequal, both within and between member states. So we know the consequences of that evolution. Citizen support for European integration has weakened, Populist parties have won on an anti-European platform. Fact is that there is a growing income inequality in the European Union with large income gains among the top 10% of earners as one of the main courses. This is a process which has started not during the crisis as, as I said already, but some 30 years ago. And we see also that the average annual real uh, disposable income growth per decile and country from the mid-80s to the crisis, 2008, has not uh, really increased, special, or has much less increased for the lower side. When you see, see the first decile and the second decile, the, the growth of income is much lower than the growth uh, in practically all the countries than the uh, growth of the 10th uh, or especially the 10th uh, decile. So it is clear that after 2008, and the crisis, followed by austerity policies, there has been no fundamental change. Rising unemployment has contributed to that, and poverty issue, which has had been one core objective in Europe's 2020 strategy, has been missed. There is a growing awareness of a socio-economic divide in Europe. Income inequality levels across European countries, and uh, I think we have uh, another 
uh, chart here where we, you see the evolution of uh, uh, in different countries uh, of the bottom bottom quintile and the medium uh, median income where you see that uh, especially the uh, uh, the bottom quintile have not improved their uh, situation the 2020 strategy adopted in 2010 established the objective of lifting 20 million people out of the risk of poverty and social exclusion. This objective will not be met by 20 and, uh, 2020, uh, 2020, because in 2015, we had not less poor people in Europe, we had more people, 1.7 million people more uh, 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 affected by the risk uh, of poverty uh, in uh, the European Union. So uh, we see that this uh, 2020 strategy, which was one of the uh, flagships uh, in uh, fighting poverty in the European Union, uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, at, uh, in some difficulties, although now there is a push for coming back to it, and especially in the uh, uh, context uh, of uh, reviving, revitalizing the social dimension in the European Union. And I refer especially to the pillar of social rights, but uh, 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 there is one uh, major issue there, uh, that's the implementation, and that's the financing of the uh, changes uh, in the context of the pillar, pillar of, uh, 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 of social rights. So, uh, are we able indeed to uh, uh, have the finances in all the countries, and especially in those where inequality has been uh, uh, widening most to help them to rebuild in some way also uh, some uh, solidarity in their uh, society. I, uh, in, that, in that context, uh, I, uh, I refer also to, to the, the need to balance economic and financial governance in the European Union. Social governance is, as a minister attending the uh, EBSCO Council, so the, the Council for, for Social Ministers and Labour Ministers, there is a total imbalance between, on one hand, the economic and especially the fiscal governments and the social balance. And there has to be, and I hope that uh, we can develop some, uh, some new uh, dynamic through the pillar of social rights, there has to be an improvement in the overall governance of the European Union in the sense that social rights, social standards, uh, social uh, uh, improvements has really to be taken into account. But as you know, uh, and we are here in the in the bank, uh, it's the Eurogroup mainly who is managing the whole economic government governance, and uh, the social aspect is not uh, at high uh, on uh, their agenda. But uh, there is now uh, the recognition that uh, Europe needs some different kind of governance. There are proposals which have been made by the French, for instance, and that we have to rebalance a bit uh, this government's governance, including also uh, the issue of uh, 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 social, uh, the social issues, and including also inequality. And there has been now a report presented by the European Parliament, and this report says something very, uh, very important. I quote it, the, the Parliament affirms that inequalities threaten the future of the European project erode its legitimacy and can damage trust in the EU as an engine of social progress. A dimension of the union which needs to be developed recalls that current inequalities have negative effects undermining political and social stability. So the debate on, uh, on inequality is, is in Europe, is uh, in uh, uh, the European uh, policies, and we have now uh, to deliver some very concrete measures giving also the 2020 strategy some chance at least to uh, improve uh, the situation. Now, after these general uh, ideas, I will uh, come to, uh, to uh, some reflection on Luxembourg. Now, uh, there are so many very prominent experts on inequality and uh, uh, revenue distribution in, in this room. I will not uh, insist on all the quantitative approaches and all the comparisons. But I think, uh, and uh, uh, the director of the static, uh, I, I speak under his control. So there is also in Luxembourg, and you mentioned that before, 
some increase of inequality, absolutely. So we have to say it, because if we do not say it, we do not deal with it. So you have to say it, you have to recognize it in order to deal with it. So when we look at the, the easiest uh, uh, index, the uh, Gini index coefficient, we see, for instance, that Luxembourg has switched uh, from 0.25 to 0.28, 29. So there is a, uh, an increase, but Luxembourg is not alone. And I wanted to make this remark, because when you look at very quite equal societies, and I said just before, Luxembourg was a quite, and still is, a relatively equal society. And when you compare that to other relatively or more or less equal societies, especially the Nordic societies, the social democratic Nordic model, where equality was a very basic uh, and a value, well, we see also that in these societies, uh, inequality has increased. So the Gini index shows absolutely also the same evolution and sometimes even more than in Luxembourg. In Sweden, from 20 to 20, uh, point 20 to point 0.28. In Finland, from point 0.21 to point 0.27. In Norway, 23, 27. In Denmark, point 0.22 to 27. So this shows that even in very equal societies, during the last 15 years, there has this tendency uh, uh, for uh, an increase in, uh, 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 in, uh, in or some deterioration in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, equality. Now, uh, coming back to one of my uh, ideas is e equality depends first, or in income in inequality depends first on wages because people live on wages mainly. So, Looking at that, I see that in, uh, in uh, Luxembourg, wages have not had this tremendous explosion, uh, uh, people think. They have, and especially uh, there are figures showing that high, high wages have got a, quite a, a, a huge, quite a strong uh, increase. Middle wages, some increase, but not so tremendous. And low wages have remained rather flat. So this is something which, uh, and that's not the figures of uh, uh, during, after the crisis. You see that 2007, low wages are quite flat, with especially one small uh, reduction. Same thing for the middle. But the high wages, they are in a very uh, clear upward uh, tendency. So this is, I think, one of the reasons. And this, uh, there are a lot of explanations for that because the economy has changed. Uh, we have a very strong uh, sector in this economy with relatively high wages. Uh, the financial sector very clearly, which shows also that the crisis has not affected so much the high wages in that respect. And uh, this brings, certainly, because when we are reasoning in terms of inequality on the basis of the uh, Gini uh, 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 index, this makes that, for instance, inequality in the society is increasing, which means that the gap between those who earn high salaries, high wages, and those who gain smaller wages is, is increasing. And this, uh, the result of that is certainly um, uh, uh, is more inequality. Now, having a look, who is uh, uh, suffering most of this inequality? Uh, who is the most exposed to uh, the risk of poverty? Risk of poverty defined as 60% of the median income. Well, that's internationally recognized, so use, we have to use this, uh, this index. So, we know that the young, the young, up to 24 years, have the highest risk of poverty. They do not get in Luxembourg any revenue, nor uh, uh, guarantee the, the RMG, the, the, uh, the guaranteed revenue. So they have not high revenues normally. Single parents with children, they have by far the highest risk. And this is also a category you find in all the European and international statistics. The highest risk for poverty are the single parents with children. So 
This is not an exceptional situation for Luxembourg. This is a very common uh, in Europe. Uh, uh, single parents are the most exposed to risk. And um, households with children have a higher risk than households with, without children. And then something which is interesting also, and which is not surprising, when you compare the uh, risk of poverty with the occupation, well, obviously, you see that those with less qualified are much, uh, the risk for less qualified are much, is much higher uh, uh, than the average. So they are much more exposed to the risk of, uh, of uh, poverty. So it's obvious that the labor market uh, has an important role in determining the poverty risk. This explains also why women are exposed to a higher risk, part-time jobs, less qualified or less paid. Uh, or uh, coming later on the, lab uh, on the labor market. So this is uh, some discrimination of women on the labor market explains also why uh, women are suffering more from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, inequality. This is figures before social benefits, before social transfers. When you are looking after social transfers, transfers the, the picture is changing. Uh, uh, absolutely, it's changing. The risk of poverty declines. The average risk goes down from 28% to something like 15%. But the categories suffering most from uh, the poverty risk remain the same. There is no change in the hierarchy, but uh, certainly there is an alleviation of the risk, the poverty risk for all of them. So, what can we do as a uh, uh, Anthony At Atkins, at the end of his book, uh, one of his chapters uh, uh, is, is uh, with the title, What Can We Do? For the young people sp especially, uh, they are often needs. The needs are the most exposed to the poverty risk. The needs are those who are become the less qualified, the low qualified. And I think we have really to deal with this young people in terms of lifting their education, lifting their qualification. That's why European-wide, including in Luxembourg, we have introduced the youth guarantee. What is the youth guarantee? Well, you give young people who are unemployed, so the most exposed to, to, uh, to poverty, you give them the guarantee to get a qualification, to get better skills, and also to help them uh, finding, uh, finding a job. My proposal would be you extend this youth guarantee by a real education guarantee a real skills guarantee that finally, but not only a guarantee, but also an obligation. That means that each young person up to 18 years has an obligation, has an obligation to be trained, to be skilled. This exists in some countries, Austria, exists also in the Netherlands, I think partly. And this shows that with such an obligation and a guarantee, because both things have to go together, you achieve a uh, first very good record on youth unemployment, very low youth unemployment. And second, you uh, really try also during the whole life to uh, reduce a bit uh, the uh, uh, inequality threat which, uh, and exposure of this, uh, of this group. The second, single parents. I think here uh, this government has uh, reviewed a bit the taxation, but I think uh, in this context, it is fundamental to have quality childcare. So quality childcare is, especially for single parents, at free quality childcare. This is an absolute condition, I would say, to bring this person in a normal working life. Because very often these persons cannot work full time, so have low wages. They cannot get better skills because they they have not the opportunity at the time to be better skilled. So we have really to work on this childcare. And, uh, well, I'm not here to, uh, to campaign for anything, but to say we have started to improve childcare and also uh, the gratuity of childcare. But that's really key for poverty prevention. Childcare is for more than one reason. First, for the reason I just mentioned, for the parents, for the single parent, but also for the child. Because we all know that poverty... Uh, starts not once you enter the working, uh, the labor market, starts much, much more time before. And I think this is also something, uh, if we want to correct uh, 
the inheritance of poverty, you have to start at early age. And then the, my uh, third point is for the low skilled, because they have a high risk, uh, though it's lowered uh, after social transfers. And here also, I would say, uh, first, we have to reflect on the level of our minimum wage. I maintain this. We have to reflect on that. Second, we have really to, uh, to work on skills. And again, the less qualified are those who get the less skills or a training once in work. The best qualified get most of uh, long life learning and the less qualified get much less. So we have not to perhaps to reverse this situation, but we have really to lift the possibilities for the less qualified to uh, get uh, training on the job to improve their skills. And this is really, I think, uh, a very important uh, element also, especially in the, uh, 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 in the, in, in the context of, of new technologies. And I will uh, make a few remarks on that because there will be an impact on the labor market uh, on the structure, wage structure, and, and also on inequality by the uh, digitalization, by the introduction uh, of new technologies. The risk that the broad diffusion of new technologies will increase the wage gap by increasing the difference between those familiar with these technologies and those who are not is quite big. It opens also the discussion of a labor market polarization. The labor market polarization, meaning that middle class jobs requiring a moderate level of skills seem to disappear relative to those at the bottom, at those at the top requiring uh, greater skill, uh, skills levels. And this brings us to another very sensitive issue, that's the middle class jobs and the middle classes as such. We have seen on the figure, the previous figure on the the evolution of the wages, that finally the middle class wages have grown, but not so fast and not so tremendously much. And this puts the question of, uh, 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 of polarization, so at the disadvantage of the middle class and the middle class wages. And uh, 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 this is not just a question of, uh, uh, of uh, economics or social, it's a it, it risks to become a political issue because the middle classes get very strongly the feeling that they are the losers of this process because uh, they have the expectation to climb and especially the expectation for their children. So if they get the feeling that this new technological evolution brings them down, that the perspective even for their kids are not those they expect it to be, this is a big risk, economically speaking, but also eventually political speaking. And we have seen uh, what, uh, in terms of populism, this can lead. And I, I link that also because Professor Cheval is here to the feeling of déclassement. And I think the middle classes having this feeling that they will be declassified after having for decades the illusion to join the upper uh, designs. Uh, I think this has... Uh, this has uh, really uh, important consequences. And therefore, we have uh, uh, to integrate that in our reflection, in our policies. Education is, is absolutely key, I think. We have to improve globally in Europe, but also in Luxembourg, our education uh, system. I have talked about childcare and trying to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to have some level playing field between the children before, finally, they go uh, to school. I have insisted a lot on lifelong learning systems. We have to rethink the lifelong learning systems, not only for those who are less qualified, but also for those at the middle. Because if they lose their jobs, well, very difficult in the digital age to find a new job. So we have to rethink what, what can we do with them? Uh, how can we improve their skills to remain in this digital society, in this digital economy, or eventually, through mobility, reorient them towards uh, different jobs in, uh, in the economy or in uh, some other uh, 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 sectors of, of, of society. So polarization, polarization, uh, which uh, 
is a risk of this digital evolution uh, has to be faced and we have to find right answers in uh, in uh, in uh, policies in our policies to that well, as one remark i also want to say in the context of inequality and that's gender inequality gender inequality has to remain absolutely on the agenda there's one positive point in luxembourg the, ge the gender pay gap is one of the smallest in europe this is quite positive but there is one issue which explains, nevertheless, the overall earning gap in Luxembourg between men and women. And that's the low employment rate of women in Luxembourg. It's nearly not understood. There are good reasons and it, it can be understood, but it is, it, at the first glance, it's not understandable why Luxembourg is one of those countries where the employment rate of women is still so low. So the, really, there has to be a, a, a high investment and, and, and good policies to bring win, women on the labor market. First, to give them the chance to be full-time and not part-time, because many women are part-time because they are obliged to be part-time. That's a very important issue linked again to uh, the whole organization of our society. Uh, uh, they do not agree? <laughs> Taxation system. We have improved it now, but I think we have still to go on improving it because our taxation system is still discouraging the second earner in the, in the household. And the second earner is very often considered to be, uh, to be the wife, the woman. We have to work on better life work or work life balance uh, because this is also an issue for, especially not only for men, it is also an issue for men, but together with women. And we have to make sure that women have exactly the same skilling, reskilling, upskilling opportunities than men. And this is again linked to time, because you have to find the time, the right time, to be upskilled and to, be, uh, 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 to, to find new opportunities, uh, working opportunities. So I'm at the end of my, how much time? Give me three minutes to yes, conclude. Sorry, okay. So I have not talked too much about wealth. That would be an interesting topic because we have in Europe, in OCD, in Luxembourg, a certain concentration of wealth. This is absolutely true. And this contributes also to inequality. And when you look at the uh, Gini coefficient, when you have the wealth, then Luxembourg has quite high uh, Gini coefficient, which shows that there is certainly a high concentration of wealth. But this is an issue which brings us to taxation and so on, and is linked also to, partly to the uh, real estate uh, uh, situation in Luxembourg because very often wealth is linked to uh, real estate. Second is um, an, an, an issue which uh, I, I, I want to come back briefly is, is, is working poor, those people who are working poor, and the labor market as such. I think that Luxembourg has to invest in quality jobs. It's not jobs, just jobs. It's quality jobs. Meaning, if we want to have a more productive economy, if we want to raise productivity, we have to have quality jobs asking for well-skilled people. So investment in people is one essential issue. If we want to have this qualitative, qualitative growth or quality economy, we have also to invest more in people and not consider that uh, low-scale jobs with low salary is a good solution. That means that we have to find solutions for those who cannot be scaled so easily. And here I think we have to find original solutions through the social economy, because I'm a minister also of social economy, who uh, can offer people jobs in the society, in collective works and so on, uh, certainly at lower levels, at lower salaries, but with a job, because the, the, the objective of fighting, of combating inequality is going always through job, but correctly paid job. Job should not be uh, equal to poverty. Job should allow people to have a decent living. And when we see what happened in Germany, uh, we have an increase of working, of working poor, 5%. 
the highest level in the European Union. And when we see that was due to these reforms where people found small jobs, mini jobs, but finally cannot make out a living of that. Um, now, uh, to conclude, inequality is certainly an issue in Luxembourg, as in all European countries. Thanks to a broad and rather efficient welfare and redistribution system, corrections, and I would say important corrections, have been made. So we need also in this country an, an efficient welfare system. Uh, but that means also that we have to adapt, to modernize, to innovate our welfare system. So we need more social in innovation to respond better and swifter to changing needs and risks. Retrenchment or austerity are certainly not the right answers. If we want to maintain the cohesion of our society, and that's finally the, the key issue, reduce, reducing inequalities is very important. We are fa facing a new technological revolution with risks, but also opportunities. Our welfare system, including health and employment, can benefit from a lot of these innovations. So, as our society is changing in economic terms through the labor market, but also through more fragmented family structures and greater diversity, we need a higher level of creativity, both technical and political, in uh, designing our social uh, policies. Therefore, uh, I uh, just wanted to mention the, the well-being index, showing also that well-being is very much linked to income and to equality. You cannot have a, a, a society with high levels of well-being, which is a society of high levels of inequality. That's also something which goes together. So this is an invitation for all those who are involved in this study of inequality. I think we need, we need this uh, further studying of inequality. We need to better understand its causes. We need also to better understand the ways how to combat inequality in Luxembourg, but also in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. And I will finish with one sentence, uh, uh, a formula which was used by Olaf Palme, the former Swedish social democratic prime minister, and he said, equality is utopia that must be constantly redefined and conquered anew. And I think this is what we have to do. And hopefully, we have a lot of people who help us to reinvent the right ways to do it. Thank you.